All right, so jumping in here, you can see, once again, electromagnetic energy. We're gonna start out with that. These things are just so we can kind of understand these ideas of electron configurations and then ultimately the periodic table and some of its trends, okay? And we will end up talking a little bit about molecular and ionic compounds. Um, and then that's going to lead us into the idea of naming uh, compounds, which will be important as well. So there's a lot of uh, big concepts in this chapter that we're going to be looking through, okay? The first thing we want to do, though, is go over electromagnetic energy and um, try to give it, get a basic understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum and try to understand things like wavelength of a, of an, um, of a wave, energy wave, and how that uh, pertains to the quantity uh, or the quantization of energy itself. So a smaller wavelength, larger amount of energy. A larger wavelength, less amount of energy. So those kind of uh, ideas we're gonna be able to, to see through this uh, section, okay? So electromagnetic energy um, is nothing new, right? So here we see back in the 17th century, Isaac Newton uh, considering the ideas of white light and how that's a, that's a rainbow of colors, actually, the white light. And it contains um, <clears throat> only a small portion of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So, but light is energy, and um, that, but that is the, the light, visible light is what we call it, is only a very tiny portion of the energy that we can see. We can just see the light because our eyes are attuned to those frequencies and those wavelengths of light. <clears throat> okay, so what is a wave? It's an oscillation or a periodic movement that can transport energy from one point to another point. So that's how we're going to define these waves. So it's transferring the energy from one place to another place. Um, the energy is moving along a wave. And you're probably familiar with waves. These waves that we're talking about are invisible to us, but um, other waves that you might see are like in the ocean, right? That's also a periodic movement of energy being transferred from one point to another point. So that's, that's kind of the idea. Or if I had a rope and I flung it, I would see the energy being transferred from one place to another place through that periodic movement, okay? Uh, dropping a pebble in a pond also um, would give you that uh, same effect where you drop it and then the energy would move out away from the, the rock, um, transferring the energy from one place to another place. Now in each of these cases that we just talked about, this is kinetic energy. That's what we refer to as kinetic energy. Kinetic energy being the energy of motion. It's energy that's in motion, okay? <clears throat> and that's different than potential energy. Potential energy is energy that's stopped or not in motion. So think of a dam holding water, right? The water has lots of potential to do some sort of work when it uh, is transferred from potential into kinetic energy. And so that's the idea uh, between these, these two terms of kinetic energy and potential energy. Now, all light on the electromagnetic spectrum travels at the exact same speed. And that is because light uh, doesn't have mass. Okay? So it doesn't weigh anything. Uh, and it can travel at the speed of light, which is essentially the uh, fastest moving um, speed that we, we can obtain is the speed of light. And that's because uh, matter that doesn't have mass can travel at that speed. But matter that does have mass cannot. So we cannot travel at the speed of light. <clears throat> so they've even tried to take atoms and they put them into these uh, atom accelerators. And uh, these, these huge accelerators. And they put these atoms in there. 
and they just get it going faster and faster and faster. And uh, they, so they take these hydrogen atoms and try to get them going as fast as they can, but those hydrogen atoms never reached uh, this speed. It, they can approach the speed of light, but they can never actually obtain it because once they get to that speed, their mass gets more and more dense and they start to slow down and they can't. They can never achieve the actual speed of light, um, but you can approach it. So you can approach the speed of light, but you can't ever get there. <clears throat> so some of the uh, parameters at which we will characterize these light waves are things like wavelength, the wavelength of a light, the frequency of a light, and its amplitude. So these are the terms that we would use, like the lambda here term uh, for wavelength. These are the, the Greek terms that we're going to, to use. Okay, so whenever you see these uh, terms, you'll, you'll know what they, what they stand for, that, like wavelength and frequency. <clears throat> frequency, <clears throat> excuse me, is essentially saying at this point right here, I drew a line, and I have a wave that's going to pass through that point. Now every time that the wavelength passes this point, it gets measured, okay? So frequency doesn't actually have uh, a top unit, it is only per seconds. That's it, it's the, the per seconds. And we, so you can see that term right here, <clears throat> seconds to the negative one or one over seconds <clears throat> is another way you can uh, identify that term. Um, and we often call it hertz. We just say the hertz, which is the per seconds. So how many wavelengths per second pass this point? And remember, every uh, wave travels at the same speed. So that wave travels at that speed. This wave travels at that speed. So which one, A or B, would have the higher frequency? B would have a higher frequency because it will pass this detector point more often. Okay, So it has a higher frequency. But does it have a bigger or a smaller wavelength? It has a smaller wavelength. So B has the smaller wavelength, A has a larger wavelength, and so we can measure frequency per seconds on B um, as a higher frequency than we would on A because it has a smaller wavelength. And these wavelengths would get smaller and they can get smaller and smaller, okay? So they can get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as you move through the electromagnetic spectrum. <clears throat> and we'll look at that electromagnetic spectrum here in a second. All right, now here's an equation that you should be familiar with. This is the speed of light equation um, brought to us by Albert Einstein that the um, speed or the speed of light, which is, uh, by the way, it's a constant, and we label it C here. So the speed of light C is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. And remember, wavelength is in, uh, so the, the speed of light here is measured in meters per second. Okay, so 2.998 meters per second is the speed of light. And that is equal to um, the wavelength, wavelength, which is in meters, times the frequency, which is in uh, one over seconds. Okay, so you can see we get the same units there between wavelength time frequency as the speed of light. <clears throat> Okay, 
So they, they have an inverse relationship. As the wavelength increases, the frequency decreases. And that's how you maintain the number a constant of 2.998 times 10 to the um, eighth meters per second, which I forgot to write here, times 10 to the eighth meters per second, which is important. Okay? It just means it's really, really fast. That's very, very fast. Okay. <clears throat> so here, once again, is another example of what we were just looking at above. Of frequency, we can see line A, B, and C. C has the shortest wavelength and the highest frequency, where A has the uh, biggest wavelength and the lowest frequency. Okay. Now, the electromagnetic spectrum will be the range of all the uh, different wavelengths of the light, starting from radio waves all the, up, all the way up into gamma uh, rays. And you can imagine radio waves being the longest, biggest, lowest energy waves moving up all the way to gamma radiation, which is high energy radiation. And that has um, very, 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 very tiny wavelengths. Uh, and it's uh, very high frequencies and therefore um, very dangerous because of that energy. So here we see the electromagnetic spectrum. And notice that when I start here in the radio waves, this is low energy. And it's moving this way and the high energy. Notice the wavelengths here, big. Notice the wavelengths here, small. So high energy waves would be small wavelengths. The low energy waves would be big wavelengths. Some radio waves, they uh, can, can be so large, like they're almost the size of a football field, okay? Whereas gamma radiation, uh, we're measuring with nanometers, okay? If, here's a meter, this is measured in meters right here. Um, a nanometer, uh, one nanometer is equal to one times 10 to the negative nine meters. So once you get down into this region, oh, you can see right there, uh, it's in the nanometers, okay? Whereas here is the micrometers, millimeters, centimeters, feet, and then you get bigger than that, okay? 10 to the third, that's thousands of feet. Those are big. Whereas these ones over here, 10 to the 12th, uh, very, 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 very tiny, tiny, tiny wavelengths. Which is why things like gamma radiation is so dangerous and so bad for us because it's such high energy. Um, even x-rays. Uh, when we get x-rays, um, it's not going to kill us to get an x-ray. But what do they do? They put a lead vest on you, right? <laughs> These big, heavy lead vests to stop the radiation from going to places you don't want it to go. But they'll they'll take a an X-ray of your bones or something, right? They'll expose, try to expose just what uh, needs to be exposed. And if you work with X-rays, then you also take precautions, like you'll stand out of the room. You won't stay in the room when you take an X-ray because too much X-rays um, is dangerous. Essentially, um, the frequency of exposure of these could cause or lead to cancerous events, right? Because your body can handle this stuff. I mean, you can walk outside and get irradiated by the sun all day, and you're okay. But the more times you get exposed, the more times you get exposed, um, the more chance there is that one of those exposure events will lead to a cancerous event because what's happening is that energy is interacting with your DNA. It's causing like thymine dimers and whatnot and it's, it's causing your DNA to, to um, not work correctly. And so then your body has to correct it and if your body can't, it, it can usually just corrects it, chops off the portions that are broken and it re, you know, does it. But um, if ever one of those events leads to a mutation, and that mutation 
leads to um, a change in your cell cycle to where you can't, your cell cycle goes into uh, an uncontrolled process, which also doesn't allow for apoptosis, which is the death of a cell. Because a lot of times, if a cell gets mutated, big deal, apoptosis, you're dead, see you later, no big deal. But the cell that gets um, changed by uh, you know, radiation to where the, um, it, it causes the cell cycle to go wrong and start to um, bypass apoptosis to where it just starts to replicate in an uncontrolled manner, that leads to cancer, right? And that's when it's like, oops, that's bad. Okay, but uh, uh, by protecting ourselves, so our bodies can, can save us from uh, this kind of radiation. It's, it, we, we, we've grown up in this environment to where our bodies can, are resistant to a lot of it, but the higher the exposure uh, frequency and the energy exposure, the more dangerous it is, right? So we try to limit the exposures that we can to minimal <coughs> exposures so that it won't lead to those types of events. Um, okay. So that's the electromagnetic spectrum. The big takeaways here are this. Big wavelength is what kind of energy? Low energy. Small wavelength is what kind of energy? High energy high energy. That's the big takeaways. Um, <clears throat> lar uh, high frequency, what kind of energy? High frequency, high energy. Okay. Low frequency, low energy. So same thing with the wavelength and frequency. Uh, large wavelength, low frequency. Uh, Large wavelength, low frequency, small wavelength, high frequency, frequency and energy kind of follow the same pattern there, <clears throat> but wavelength and energy are uh, opposite. Okay, let's look at a question here. So a, st a sodium street light gives off yellow light that has a wavelength of 589 nanometers. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me get it here. What is the frequency of this light? So here you see the equation. Why don't you guys take a second and try to work on that problem, okay? Uh, let me just give you this. Oh, they already did it. Not that that will make a difference yet, because <laughs> you guys already saw it. But now try it. So here's the speed of light equation. What is the frequency? Okay. See the pattern. So we want to solve for which variable? C lambda or V? V, that's the frequency, right? So we want to solve for V. So V is equal to, so here uh, to get V, we're going to divide by lambda on both sides. And we'll get C, uh, frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength. Okay, The speed of light is 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And the uh, wavelength uh, is given to us in nanometers. Can I use it in nanometers here? Can I put 589 nanometers here? Exactly, because look at this. That doesn't cancel. Nanometers and meters doesn't cancel. So this is meters. I need to convert this from 589, 589 nanometers into meters from the nanometers, okay? And they gave you the uh, conversion factor there. 
where uh, you have one nanometer is one times 10 to the negative nine meters. Okay, so that's our first job is to find that. So let's, uh, let's get a calculator here. <clears throat> so we're going to take 589 uh, times 1 times 10 to the 9 negative, okay? Uh, and we're going to get this, which is just moving my decimal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, so 5.89. meters okay so 5.89 times 10 to the negative 7 meters is what I'm going to put down here so 5.89 times 10 to the negative 7 meters now my meters cancel and I'm left with per seconds and that's what I wanted right I wanted Hertz which is uh, per seconds so or seconds to the negative 1 uh, do you guys know that if I write this seconds to the negative one? Uh, so let's say uh, meters, for uh, for example, let, yeah, let's do it there. The, um, this C I could write as 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters seconds to the negative one. And that just means that the seconds is on the bottom. That's what that's referring to. So anytime you see the negative one there by a unit, they're just saying that unit is actually on the bottom rather than on the top. So it's meters per seconds uh, or meters seconds negative one. So you're going to see it written that way sometimes. So just hopefully you guys understand what that means. Okay. So uh, this is for our wavelength here. And um, here we go. This is the conversion. They just did it right there in the question. And they got 5.09 times 10 to the to the 14th seconds to the negative one, meaning per seconds or hertz. They could have written it as hertz as well. Hertz, right, is the other unit that you can use at, for frequency or per seconds. So, okay, well, let's just do the math up here so we we can see it on the calculator. So we're going to take 2.998. Um, times 10 to the 8th, and we're going to divide it by 5 point, darn it, Sorry, hit my screen. There we go. Um, let's, try, let's, try, let's try that again. Okay, 2.99x, 8, um, times 10 to the 8th divided by, okay, that's not, something's wrong, okay, 2.998 times 10 to the 8th divided by 5.89 times 10 to the negative 7. Okay, so here is what we get, 3, 6, which is 5.09 times 10 to the 14th, which is what they got, okay? And so that's how, that's how you go about doing that. Let's move forward. <clears throat> okay, they're just showing radio towers uh, or um, cell towers broadcasting electromagnetic waves like radio waves or cellular waves. Uh, if you go back up here and look at the elect electromagnetic spectrum, radio waves very low, even cell phone waves are very low, wireless data, microwave ovens. Oh, that surprises people a lot of times because people are like, oh, microwave oven, that's dangerous. Uh, so just really quick, why does a microwave oven heat your food? And along with that, if I take a paper plate and I stick it in a microwave oven, will it heat the paper plate? It will not. Has anybody ever, have you done that? I've done that. Um, 
So why does it not heat the plate, the paper plate, but it will heat your food? Exactly. Microwaves are attuned, the frequency of a microwave is attuned to vibrate water. So if there's no water present, it's not gonna get hot. But if water is present, it's going to get hot. So if you're an organic person or, or animal, then you don't wanna be in a microwave because all the water inside of you would get hot and boil, right? So that would be bad. But uh, microwaves themselves are not high energy waves. They're low energy waves. They're just attuned to vibrate water molecules. So that's what they, they do. So a little cockroach running around in your microwave, he doesn't care. He's like, yeah, shoot those microwaves at me all day long. They have an exoskeleton, right? Can't penetrate with these wimpy little microwaves, right? So you're not going to kill a cockroach that way. <laughs> not in a microwave. All right. <clears throat> so those are low energy. We'll broadcast uh, this kind of energy all day long, right? Everywhere. Um, and these wavelengths um, are small enough to fit through the the uh, the between the nuclei of atoms, and that's how I can get a cell signal in this room, even though it's enclosed, right? Well those wavelengths will broadcast through the walls. And they're just being broadcast everywhere. Okay? But um, low energy, so we're not worried about it. It's lower energy than this, than this light. Right? When you look at that, oh, that's another good point. Look at the uh, visible light region. So here we have our remotes, IR, infrared. This is all low energy, lower than, than uh, even visible light, right? Uh, radar, wireless data, cell phones, all lower energy than visible light. But then when you get into the ultraviolet light region, you're like, oh, that's kind of dangerous. Let's be careful, right? Let's start being careful about the, those higher energy. So notice that blue light is higher energy than red light, not a lot because the visible light region is so tiny that there's not a huge difference between those two, but there is. Red light is lower energy than blue light, which is higher energy uh, because the wavelengths that would be created for those would be different. Okay. All right. Uh, that's just harmonics. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about... So I guess we can talk a little bit about this, uh, this interference patterns. And the only reason, uh, really quick, we'll bring it up is because when we, when we talk about the way that an electron orbits the nucleus, okay? Let's say that's the nucleus. And you have different types of orbitals. You have S orbitals, which will uh, orbit the uh, nucleus in a spherical fashion, so the electrons are orbiting in a, within a sphere, okay? So within that sphere, uh, you'll find the electron, that's called an S orbital, S orbital, okay? Now we have these kind of orbitals as well, which are P orbitals. And P orbitals are more, you're finding the electron within this region, and then there's this nucleus, which is the node. And a node um, shows an interference pattern, what we're talking about here, the interference path pattern of a destructive interference or constructive interference. When you have destructive interference, it goes to zero. So at the node or the nucleus, you're, you're, you're going to zero, okay? So um, that's the only reason I'm mentioning this. So, which just means you have one wave traveling like this in this direction, right? It's going this way. And then you have another wave traveling in this direction. And when they hit, they interfere with one another. And that interference destroys that wave. Okay? So, the energy will go to zero. Because you have this much energy going this way, this much energy going this way. And if they hit, they'll destroy one another. Whereas if you have 
um, this wave and then another wave coming behind it and this one hits this one, that will add to it, right? Then the energy will combine and then you get what's called constructive interference. That's constructive interference, okay? So when I mention these p orbitals again and we talk about this node or the nucleus right here, that's what we're talking about, that destructive interference that creates the node uh, between the two. Okay, that's all, that's all we need to take away from that. Okay, and here you can see some of those, those nodes uh, coming, coming out, all these places where we have the destructive uh, interference happening at those nodes. Okay, uh, and you see nodes here as well, right, that are being created. Okay, there's that word again. Like I said, th these things aren't going to be too important. Here, here's just a vibration pattern showing, once again, um, the, the sign of nodes and, uh, in different uh, patterns and such, where you, where you can see the place where the, um, the energy uh, doesn't reach, right? Okay, don't need to talk about black bodies. We're okay with that. That's just why stuff glows. If you've ever wondered, why is that thing glowing? Just because it's hot. It's because the radiation is um, giving off the, that energy, which we call the black body energy that allows it to irradiate like that. Okay, here's a good spot to go next, okay? Planck's constant. Okay, Planck had to assume that the vibrate, vibrating atoms required quantized energy. So when he says quantized energy, he's talking about this. Kind of like stair-step energy. Um, this is the lower energy, uh, and you have an electron here, let's say. And then it moves up to the medium energy. And to do that, it has to absorb energy. So the electron absorbs energy and that will allow it to move from one quantized state into the next quantized state. Okay? And to move up into the next quantized state, it needs to absorb even more energy. So the more and more energy that you absorb, the higher and higher you will move up into these different energy levels. That's what we call them, the energy levels. So Planck um, was able to understand this idea that electrons can, um, as they're orbiting around the nucleus, they are quantized into these energy levels. Some electrons have higher energy than other electrons, okay? And so when, when we draw an, a model of an atom, sometimes we draw this first ring, which is the first energy level, and then we'll draw a second ring, which represents the second energy level. And then we'll draw a third ring, which represents the fourth energy, well, that's third. The third energy level, not the fourth. It'll represent the third energy level, um, and so forth. And if you look at your periodic table for a second, and if you could imagine, look at the, a hydrogen's period. The elements in hydrogen's period are hydrogen and helium. And then you move to the second period. Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. And then you move to the third period. Sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon. Every time I move to a new period, that's a new ring. That's a new ring or a new energy level. The periodic table is organized by the energy levels of the electrons. So we get a lot of information from the periodic table in that way. It tells us the number of valence electrons that they have. We can see that by the columns. But going across the periods, uh, we increase in energy levels. 
the electrons would be increasing in energy levels. So getting down to Francium's number 87 period, the last period, how many rings or energy levels would I have around my atom? Very, the very last period, Francium's period, number 87. Seven. So the highest number of energy levels that we would have around any atom would be seven energy levels. Okay, that's uh, what we'd have. And every time you add an energy level, you increase in size of the energy level. So for example, this first energy level can only hold two electrons. The next energy level can hold eight electrons. The next energy level can hold 18. The next one can hold 32. So it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you increase your energy level. You can hold more and more and more electrons. Okay? Now, Planck's, through his research, was able to come up with a constant that they call Planck's constant. Here it is. Okay? And this will help us relate things like wavelength or frequency to the energy of the wave. So in other words, we can calculate the energy because now Planck's constant is showing us the energy times the seconds in joules. So that's joules of energy. That's an energy unit. Okay. So we have joules of energy times the seconds. So if I got rid of the seconds by multiplying by the hertz, I'd be left with only energy, right? So I could calculate the energy from the, uh, the frequency very easily, okay? And you can relate it to the wavelength as well. So if I know the wavelength, I can find the energy. If I know the frequency, I can find the energy. If I know the energy, uh, vice versa, I can find the frequency or the wavelength, okay? So uh, we're going to see how that's accomplished. All right. Once again, a lot of uh, background that uh, you guys are welcome to, to read over. Okay, but this is where I wanted to get to. Okay, so <clears throat> um, the energy of photon depends on their frequency according to Planck's constant that we just saw. Here it is. Here's the, the formula. Energy is equal to Planck's constant, H, times the uh, frequency. Now, uh, we know that C is equal to lambda frequency. And if I solve for the frequency, which we did earlier, this is the equation I would get. Frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength. Now, if I just trade this term for frequency out from here, and I just put C over lambda here, um, which is frequency also, then I get another equation where energy can be calculated from Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by uh, lambda or the wavelength, okay, which is in meters. All right, so these two equations right here will help us calculate energy either from the frequency or from the um, wavelength, okay? If it's with the wavelength, I need the speed of light term as well. Both of these are constants that you would be given like on a reference sheet. You go to your reference material, you would find Planck's constant, you plug it in there. You find the speed of light, you plug it in there because those are both constants. You don't have to come up with those. They're not going to be given in the question because you'll have because they're constants that you can find from your uh, reference materials okay and then um, whatever they tell you is the wavelength in the question you can then calculate the energy from that or vice versa if they give you the energy you'll be able to calculate the wavelength based on the fact that these two things are constants okay so 
uh, in that way it will be easy to to do okay <clears throat> all right so energy uh, frequency and Planck's constant um, so here is an example of that okay so we have a, a neon sign we're observing radiation from the excited neon atoms so in other words I guess I will go back to this so what they're what they're trying to show here is energy uh, can eject electrons so the the electron will absorb the energy and be ejected um, and you can measure um, the speed uh, of that energy uh, and find its wavelength and things okay of that electron that's being ejected okay and once you know the wave that uh, you can identify those wavelengths of light uh, so for example here the the radiation has a wavelength of 640 nanometers what is the energy of the photon being emitted well now we can calculate the energy because we're given the wavelength okay so let's just take this uh, without looking at it first let's just go we have 640 nanometers and energy is equal to Planck's constant um, times the speed of light divided by the wavelength okay so given the wavelength I can find the energy uh, very easily okay so let's go up here and grab Planck's constant um, for some reason I can't remember off the top of my head. 6.626 times 10 negative 34. So 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34. And that's going to be joule seconds is Planck's constant. Okay. Um, and then we have 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters. Um, per second and I'm just gonna write the units down like that so you can s easily see the seconds here are going to cancel okay and um, now I need my wavelength uh, 640 nanometers is that gonna work so I just put 640 there Okay, so look at this. Do those units match? No, will they cancel? They will not. So I can't use nanometers. Uh, I have to use meters. So I just need to do that conversion like we did before, 640 nanometers to the meter, meters from the nanometers. There are one times 10 to the negative nine meters for every one nanometer, okay? So, um, that means I'm going to get 6.40 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. That's what we're going to put here. 6.40 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Um, and now they will cancel and I'll be able to calculate uh, the energy 6.626 times 10 to the negative 4 times 2.998 times 10 to the 8 divided by 6.40 times 10 to the negative 7 okay which is what we see down here as well um, and we're left with 3.10 times 10 to the negative 19 okay okay all right oh okay <clears throat> don't need to focus too much on those line spectras they're just uh, that's how we get our different colors right because the emission of electrons when you excite electrons will give different colors of light so that's what that's what we see like with this neon sign okay um, exciting different electrons at different energies don't worry about that don't need to go into that there we go